going to, I was going to remind you, and of course I forgot to remind you, so I'm glad you remembered. Oh, well, I'm just going to be flipping back and forth on our our video here tonight. I'm trying out a new camera, folks, so it's not going to look exactly the same, but, uh, you know, we're, we'll fine-tune things, and, um, well, that's just how it'll be. So, uh, we have the horses. They're uh, making their way over there to the stable. They and certainly are. And the horses are almost ready. I'm getting the, there. I'm getting there. <laughs> the groomsmen have been so kind as to fish out a fresh batch of carrots for the the uh, the kind equestrian folks there. And uh, well, you know, it's uh, it's April, and the weather is kind of weird. It keeps going back and forth from slightly warm to snowing. And I sure did like that slightly warm when it was happening. <laughs> kind of like putting on a nice pair of slippers in the morning. Yeah, <clears throat> it really was nice. And I'm telling you, it snowed. The snow came back and we got like an inch maybe. But just seeing that snow again was like, oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm almost there. I'm almost there, folks. Mm -hmm. Oh, <clears> throat> throat> yes, the uh, hubby in the chat room is saying that uh, he, I, I didn't beat him. We don't believe in domestic violence here. I didn't beat him uh, well enough to get the uh, the new camera, uh, you know, on the up and up tonight. But uh, uh, you know, well, DJ tried, and I did <clears throat> exactly what professional broadcasters should never do try something at the last minute uh, and uh, somehow many ca many cam just shut my the sound down or something oh uh, all right i am now finally ready to go i'm in the chat room hi everyone excellent so i will start this off here ladies and gentlemen welcome to the beautiful, historical Marionette Theater. It is Friday evening, and you're here for the show about film and television trivia with DJ Star Sage and Toffee Smelly. Grab your seats. And uh, you know what I think I'll do here? I'm going to do something... That gives us a little bit of background. So one sec. Let's see. Stay Are back. you going to try a special effect? Maybe. Work all night on a drink of rum. Tonight, we're going to be discussing a film from 1979. This is a screwball comedy. And uh, it stars the famous private eye, Mr. Peter Falk, and uh, Alan Arkin, who happened to work on the song you're hearing here. Oh, oh yeah. How about that? Uh, is that weird, folks, or not? Alan Arkin, the actor, has something to do with this song. Can you believe it? Mm, that makes me want to go to the uh, the Caribbean there, just thinking about that banana boat. <laughs> yeah, he, he kind of co-wrote this song. Um, and I say kind of because, well, there's a bit of a story there, and we will get to it. Do you guys mind starting the stupid show? Oh, wow. Okay. You'll have to excuse Gertie. She's a little grumpy tonight. When we came into the theater... She was asleep in the lobby. I was not asleep. I was, I was, I was not asleep. Okay. Did you get kicked out of your apartment again. Mm, I don't know what happened, but uh, I, she she was at least wearing, uh, you know, something over her face, which is that's not even funny. I I, I meant. Uh, uh, to for protection, not not because you're ugly. Who said ugly? Oh my god! Okay, uh, let's start. Uh, uh, can you can you assume your your place? And uh, Gertie, just give it uh, the the old college try and introduce our movie tonight. Right. <sighs> Sheldon 
is a mild-mannered New York dentist whose world is about to be unraveled when he meets his daughter's in-laws-to-be. What does the father do? Why are they late for dinner? Why does he need to use the phone in the basement? <laughs> Get on your Sunday duds. There's about to be a wedding and maybe a shooting. Peter Falk and Alan Arkin star in The In-Laws. Hit it, boys. What do you get when you take a dash of the silver screen, a pinch of golden oldies, and a smidgen of screaming? It's time for Matinee Minutia with your host, DJ and Tommy. Hey there, Toppy. I hope you had a good Easter. Did you Did you have some hard-boiled eggs? Did you see the, the bunny running down the trail? <clears throat> I got to tell you, this was the most non-Easter ever. Um, things were just too crazy, and um, things were going on in life that, well... None of us, none of, no one in my family, my parents nor I, barely even registered that it was Easter. So how was your Easter? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, poor Mama Billy, she's stuck in her assisted living place and she has to order her groceries in as someone who's being responsible should. I mean, uh, if you have the option, you know, please consider ordering your groceries in and not going outside yourself uh you know there are others that depend on you but anyways uh she normally likes to put out a spread um honk but no um you know she was a little beside herself now my sister uh dear sweet betty she did manage to think ahead and she sent us one of those catalog order snack trays that mm -hmm. she's so fond of, you know, kind of like Hickory Farms. It's a knockoff, but uh, it was nice. And uh, while we didn't have a, a you know proper Easter dinner, I, I did manage to put a little spin, as it were, on our cauliflower mac and cheese. Because, you know, <laughs> we, try to, we try to do things a little healthier around here. And, um, well, I, I diced up some hard-boiled eggs, and um, I put a little bit of mustard in the, uh, the cheese sauce. Because, yes, there is a cheese sauce. And it was... Um, cauliflower mac and cheese deviled egg style actually it was pretty good ah very good I, you guys are <clears throat> very um inventive um uh, folks i i've often gone over to dj and billy's chateau and uh, <clears throat> they they always surprise me in a very good way with um with their food choices um and uh, they did introduce me to the uh, cauliflower mac and cheese substitute, and I'll be doggone if it was. I mean it. I I am not kidding. It is just as good as mac as mac and cheese. Yeah, the key is steaming it, and uh, it's quite tender if you do it right. But you know, uh, we are actually here to talk about a movie tonight, and uh, you know, I'm sorry that uh, Easter didn't go as planned for everyone, but. We had fun talking about Willy Wonka, and I'm still thinking back on that as a thorough a kid. And, well, this movie came out when I was just a little kid, in fact. Shall I go ahead and play that trailer, Toppy? Play that crazy trailer. He's a dentist from New Jersey. Oh, Make a house call? Yes, one of those emergencies. He travels a lot on business. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I work for the CIA. He's got a successful practice. It's the first, Sean. I cannot work this way. He's got a dubious past. You were involved with the Bay of Peaks? Involved? That was my idea. In 48 hours, his son is marrying his daughter. Can I borrow you for a couple minutes? What's five minutes for a member of the family? Where are we going? Just over to my office. I want you to break into my safe. And what happens in between will bring them together. For better? Did we hit the little boy on 6th Avenue? Or for worse? No, I'm not him. Uh, he's my in-law. Look, here's my card. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. To have and to hold. I really like a chance to explain. No explaining! Just get out of my life! <laughs> in sickness? What are you laughing about? He was thrown out of the agency late last year in a mental. 
a mentor. You heard me right. And in health. <laughs> to honor and to obey. In the dirt. To love and to cherish. I'll kill him, I swear to God, kill him. Oh, my God. In prosperity. What's that? Five million bucks, just hang on. Five million dollars. And in adversity. In the good times, as well as the bad. So long as they both shall live. Come on, Vince, what's the plan? Ah, Ponte! I'm wide open. What do you got in mind? Virgo! If any person can find just cause why these two should not be joined together, <laughs> let them now speak or forever hold their peace. Call it off. <laughs> Stay the hell away from them. Come on. We cannot wait any longer. Alan Arkin. Second time! Peter Falk. Warner Brothers proudly pronounces you. See a mini hot show. In laws. The in laws. <laughs> wow. Talk about this copy. I think that that announcer may have done a, a candy commercial or two. Yes, I was just going to say exactly the same thing. Who in the chat room can name that actor who narrated that? He did. He sure as heck did not do trailers um, a lot. In fact, that's the only one I've ever heard him do it. But he has done commercials. He's done. He was a, a co-star on a fairly long-running TV series in the 70s, and he's done a million things as a character actor. Who you know was the, that actor? The one commercial that comes to mind is... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I think... Um, not not uh, Tommy in the chat room guessed Tom Bosley, <clears throat> but we'll let the guesses come in, and if I see the answer, I'll let you guys know. Uh, D J G J. Um, <clears throat> this is a 1979 movie, mm -hmm. and one of the things we like to do here is set the stage. What was going on in the world in 1979? All righty. Well, in 1979, in the U.S., a windstorm in western Washington State sank a half mile section of the Hood Canal Bridge. Yikes. In February, a total solar eclipse occurred in North America. Talk about starting off the new year. The first fully functional space shuttle orbiter, the Columbia, is delivered to the Kennedy Space Center in 79. Also, because other things happen in the world, uh, San Francisco, uh, San Francisco, San Fran I'll get the word right, San Franciscans, <laughs> Riot after the verdict of Harvey Milk and George Moscone's assassination. Mm -mm -mm. Mm -hmm. McDonald's introduced the Happy Meal in 79. Whoa. Wow. Susan B. Anthony talk about Western New York. Here, Susan B. Anthony, uh, a woman who's uh, famous for contributing to the, uh, the women's right to vote movement. Her coin was introduced in 79. That dollar coin? Oh, yeah. And then just a few other things in 79 that made an important year. Michael Jackson released his first album, which was called Off the Wall. And that year it brought in seven million, which was a pretty penny for 1979. <laughs> I guess so. And uh, President Carter, who was in office then, established the Department of Education, which has been around ever since, although some have tried to uh, get rid of it. And, Toppy, I think you'll remember this. What movie do you think may have come out in 1979 that we saw at the theater this last year? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I, I would have... Had a had a few guesses, but I saw the notes, and I have to say, I don't know as I would have remembered, but surely it was Star Trek: The Motion Picture, and it premiered at the Smithsonian. How pretentious! 
Yes, and uh, many, 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 many years later, when Star Trek hit its 25th anniversary, I actually went to the Smithsonian, to the Air and Space Museum. They had an exhibit for the original series sets and costumes. Wow. All right, folks, we do have some uh, celebrity births from 79. First of all, genital, gen, do genital? No. <laughs> Jennifer Love Hewitt. Um, she's a, a musician. Widow of Kurt Cobain. Adam Levine, another magis magician. Holy Jesus. Musician. <laughs> Nora <laughs> Jones, singer. Another singer, musician. Keisha Knight, Polium, Polium, Polium. Uh, mm -hmm. She was Little Rudy on the Cosby Show. Uh, Claire Danes, actress from My So Called Life. Kate Hudson, a uh, uh, daughter of Goldie Hawn. And I seriously did not know that. <laughs> I did not know that. Mm -hmm. Kate Hudson is Goldie Hawn's daughter. Um, Rosario Dawson. From Rent and Josie and the Pussycats. And finally, uh, <clears throat> uh, next to finally, we have Chris Pratt, the handsome uh, leading actor in the uh, couple of the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. And last but not least, Pink, a uh, singer, musician. Okay, so that was 1979. And, uh, well, in 79, because uh, The In-Laws, our film of our, our topic tonight, was a movie, I'm going to tell you a little about what else was in theaters in 79. What was competing for your attention? Because if you only had a few dollars to spare when you went out with your family, you had to be picky about what you're going to see because you weren't going to be going back that same week, probably. Uh, you know, back when we used to be able to go outside. Um, anyways, uh, Superman was number one in the box office in 79. It had Christopher Reeves in it for the first time of his uh, was it trilogy or quadrilogy. And uh, that brought in $134 million in 79. And also in the top of the box office there, we had the Amityville Horror came in. The original it was number two. And, and that was a big year for Margot Kidder, who was in both of those movies. Yes, and uh, the the future Mr. Barbara Strice and James Brolin and brought in 86.4 million. Now, some may say that this is actually the best version of that story. And uh, well, it rounding out the top of the box office was Sylvester Stallone in Rocky II. Now I don't remember, Toppy, but correct me if I'm wrong. That's not the one where he faced the Russian, was it? No. <clears throat> no, he went against Apollo for the second time. Hmm. Okay. And then, uh, well, because we are talking about the in-laws tonight, and we, of course, love the underdog, the in-laws, it, well, it, uh, it only made $38 million, so. Oh, <laughs> meatballs made more than... In our movie tonight. Yeah, it was beat out by a film called Manhattan, which starred uh, well the famous director Woody Allen and one of my personal favorites, Diane Keaton. And uh, that brought in thirty nine million. It was also beat out by Escape from Alcatraz, which had yes. Clint Eastwood, forty three million. And then, as Ty, my uh, partner in crime here said. The film with Bill Murray, the screwball <laughs> comedy Meatball, brought in forty-three million. <clears throat> there you go. Um, let's see. Now, was that the movie that kind of launched him? What was the one he did before this that had a military theme? Oh yes, uh, I'm forgetting what that one was. Now, was Dan Aykroyd in that one as well? No, I don't think so. It was oh, the strike. Right. It was Stripes. Strike, Stripes. That's that yeah. was it. I think Stripes was before Meatballs. At any rate, folks, we're going to continue now with uh, the in laws. And uh, let's play clip one, TJ. Okay. Let's see. That was the trailer, so it's going to be clip two. You think I'm bullshitting, don't you? 
No, I don't. I don't. Well, they thought I was bullshitting. Who thought you were bullshitting? The CIA. I told them. I said, fellas, the thing to do is to rob the U.S. Mint. Really rob. Professional. With real gangsters and real guns. Get the engraving. Go to Central America. Smoke out the action and nail those bastards. They thought it was too risky. They turned it down. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait a minute. The CIA turned this down? I thought you were doing it for them. I am. Well, then, well, then, they're, then they're behind you. No, this I did on my own. You robbed the United States Mint on your own? The CIA thought it was too crazy? Too risky. Yeah. So you went ahead and robbed it on your own with gangsters. You committed a federal crime. Of course it's federal. The Treasury Department is on the case. So what happens if you get caught? We won't get caught. Not if the Stop the, the weed! If you get caught, is the agency going to come forward and say it's okay? He works for us? No. 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 I'm out in the cold on this one, Shell. If I get caught, they shred my records. They say they never heard of me, and it's 20 years in the slammer. What about me? I was the one running through the streets with that goddamn thing. I was the one in the gutter. And you were tremendous, Shell. The way you handled yourself, I can't tell you how impressed I was. No, I mean this. It's been something I've been wanting to say. You were sensational, Shell. And it's an act of friendship that I will remember for as long as I live, which could be about an hour. So what do I got, an hour and a half? You have nothing to worry about. You're an innocent victim. How so? I know the cab driver knows it. We both say it. <sighs> what happens to you? Oh, I'll manage. Listen, I've been in tougher jams before. You know, back when Kennedy was president. You saw the picture in the office? Yes, I did. He was crazy about me. I was very impressed. Honey... Do you have a check? Listen, let me ask you about that picture. What, what did that inscription mean? At least we tried. Bay of Pigs. I referred to the Bay of Pigs. You were involved with the Bay of Pigs? Involved? That was my idea. I'll get this show. The Bay of Pigs. You win some, you lose some. Listen, mm -hmm. you want to be home in about an hour? Why? I want to make sure we get that engraving out of your house. What engraving? Last night, I thoughtlessly left one in your basement. An engraving from the bag? In my haste. In my basement? Why are you getting so excited? Why am I getting so excited? The central piece of evidence of the biggest federal crime since the atomic spy case is sitting in my basement. You want to know why I'm getting excited? Go back to your lunches. Do I matter in your business? I want that thing out of my house. Charlie, I'm getting to that. Sit down. Finish. Okay. Oh, my God. So that is are two heroes who are thrust together in this movie by the fact that their kids are getting married. And we've got uh, the wonderful Peter Falk. Uh, tell us what we know about Peter Falk, DJ. Okay, so as you heard in the clip there, it kind of tells you a little bit about the story. These two guys meet up because their kids are getting married. Now, one's a very straight-laced, kind of a middle-class, upper-middle-class kind of guy. That's Ellen Arkin's character, and he's a dentist. Now, Peter Falk's character, he's the, the government man, and, well, he's not quite all there. Now, Mr. Peter Falk, which, of course, everyone knows from Columbo, he's always played detective types, and uh, he was in a film that we discussed just uh, before the holidays this last year. We watched Murder by Death, and outside of acting, Peter Falk was a certified public accountant, a CPA, so he helped crunch the numbers. He worked in finance and was a member of the Board of Budget for the state of Connecticut before he became an actor. Now, uh, he also enjoyed drawing and sketching in his spare time, little did you know. And uh, he's most well known, of course, for Columbo. Now, did you know Columbo ran 13 seasons? It had 68 episodes and it began in 71. So he was already a good part of his run into that show when he starred in The In-Laws. Now, just before he did The In-Laws, he was uh, wor he worked for the director of The Exorcist, Mr. William Frederick, in The Brinks Job. That was in 78. And his film after The In-Laws was called All the Marbles, which was out in 81, directed by Robert Aldrich. And uh, this was the guy that brought you Whatever Happened to Baby Jane and the Dirty Dozen. Mm -hmm. As I recall, 
the reason I went to see this movie was Peter Falk, and I knew him as Columbo, and that was it. And it, I remember thinking, wow, what would he be like in a movie? And I, that's really what what took me to the theater to see this movie. Um, how did you first see it, TJ? Um, actually, my first exposure to this was our discussion. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Very good. Um, I saw it again. I, I only saw it that one time in the theater. So I saw it recently. And, you know, I had forgotten so much of it. Uh, so let's talk about Peter Falk's co star, um, the equally wonderful Alan Arkin. And he kind of specialized as he was getting into the industry in, in pay, playing these kind of quirky, squirrely types, or sometimes the fatherly type as he became older. Um, and he was, uh, he was known as, you know, when he came on the scene, he was known as one of these new, edgy, intense actors. And, <clears throat> um, but before, <clears throat> before that, he was a musician in a folk band. And uh, we're going to talk more about that in just a second. But his first movie role were, was in The Russians Are Coming in 1966. And prior to doing The In-Laws, he had finished Fire Sale, uh, which he directed. And Rob Reiner and Sid Caesar was in that. His film after... Uh, the in-laws was uh, the magician of Lublin in 79 that had Louise Fletcher and Shelley Winters in it. He mm. is uh, one of the only six actors to receive an Academy Award nomination right off the bat for his first screen appearance. And it was for best actor. He did not win, but he was nominated. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, well, uh, in case you were wondering, the other five actors, <laughs> Who that happened to was Orson Welles, Lawrence Tibbet, James Dean, Paul Muni, and Montgomery Clift. Now, here's, okay, of all the things, this whole thing about the Banana Boat song just drove me nuts when I found this out. And uh, uh, DJ, I sent you two Banana Boat songs, mm -hmm. and I'd like you to play the first one. Now, folks... This is the song, the version you all know, and once you hear it, you're going to go, oh, my God, that song. And we've already heard it at the beginning, but for those who didn't, uh, play that first Banana Boat song clip. So there you go. You all know that one. And you, who was that singing DJ? Do you know? I don't. Uh, that was Harry Belafonte. Gee, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, Belafonte or Belafonte. Anyways, uh, that song sort of ushered in this short but sweet era of Calypso music. <laughs> and it made uh, Harry a, a big deal star. Now, do you, uh, Toppy, can you tell me uh, what uh, the younger generations might associate that song with? There's an iconic movie that's kind of macabre. Well, I, I wouldn't have known except in looking up the song. Um, I, I remembered because it was mentioned, but um, but uh, it was um, uh, uh, Beetlejuice. Yes. <laughs> Which I hear is due for a continuation, um, maybe, maybe not. But that's been an ongoing rumor is that they want to do another Beetlejuice movie. And apparently Michael Keaton has said, sure, okay, if the money's right. Yes. Ed Tudor put a picture, DJ, of uh, Harry Belafonte. In, in the, he was a very handsome man. He's still a handsome man. Oh, and uh, uh, while we're speaking over the balcony, Toppy, uh, let us know who else is in the chat room. Yeah, we got uh, we got Aunt Tudor, 
your husband, Billy. Uh, we've got our pal, Tommy. And we thank you all for joining. Now, let me... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we have to applaud our regulars here. I know. I always forget the applause goes there. Folks, forgive me for doting on the song, but I just can't get over the fact that Alan Arkin has anything to do with it. All right. And I'm, I've got a, a short story about how the song originated. And first of all, nobody knows where or how, how old it is. It's one of those songs that was sung through the generations, particularly in Jamaica. And um, it, it, it was just in their culture and it probably sounded not much like what you just heard. And there were, there were a variety of versions, depending on where you lived, that, that uh, the words were different. And uh, they, they're just guessing that it was somewhere around the second half of the 19th century um, that uh, it may have originated. And uh, it was first recorded in 1952 um, by a Trinidad Trinidadian. Now, I never would have thought that's what you would call someone from Trinidad, but I, I guess so, a Trinidadian singer, um, Edry Connor and his bad, oh, Edric, I'm sorry, Edric Connor and his band Edric Connor in the Caribbeans. And that was kind of the first time anybody heard it. But again, didn't sound a hell of a lot like what you, uh, it sounded more like what you heard Belafonte did because he he based his version on uh, Edric Connors. Now, <clears throat> uh, so uh, the story goes that um, our hero, Alan Arkin, was in a folk music group called the Terriers. And um, and they recorded a version in 1957, and it became a hit in the UK. And Alan Arkin, um, uh, and um, and another fellow by the name of Eric Darling are credited sometimes as the writers of this song, and it's because they combined lyrics from many versions and many elements from different songs and they created this 1957 hit now dig how the different this is than the harry belafonte song play clip the second banana boat song dj Hill and gully rider, hill and gully. 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 Hmm. So that one sounded a little bit like, uh, you know, Harry Belafonte may have stopped over at the uh, hotel at Petticoat Junction. <laughs> that is hilarious. <laughs> that is that is true. But anyways, you know, that's how different the songs were. And Alan Arkin is credited with co-writing that particular version. Oh, for heaven's sakes, I'm sorry we got off on that tangent, but I just couldn't get over it. <laughs> CJ, there's one other uh, guy that we recognize in, in this uh, movie. Who's that, Ed? Yes, well, uh, this poor man, he's a grown man, and I want to say he's possibly in his 60s by now. He's still going by Junior. That's because his father was a well-known actor back in the day, Mr. Ed Bagley, 
Jr. now. And uh, Ed Bigley Jr. was in the in-laws and he was he was a government man and he was uh, well, he was basically Vincent's and that's Peter Falk's character, Vincent's boss. Now, there comes a time in the movie where Alan Arkin's character ends up phoning in because he wants to check up on this guy. He's He's got a screw loose and he wants to find out, is this guy legit? Well, Ed Bigley Jr. plays the boss and uh, he's most well known for his role on the uh, the hospital soap St. Elsewhere, which ran from 82 to 88. His character was Dr. Victor Ehrlich, and uh, he received an Emmy nomination during each viewing season of that show's run. Now, of course, nowadays, Mr. Ed Begley Jr. is more well known for guest appearances, but he is a very prominent environmentalist. In fact, uh, you can see many documentaries, and uh, he is very well known for riding his bicycle and having a uh, self-powered house with solar panels. <laughs> there you go. So let's talk about the uh, creative team behind it. First of all, the director, Arthur Hiller. And he began his whole career on TV. And you would have seen him. Well, you wouldn't have seen him. But you would have seen him in the credits, I guess. On uh, such uh, shows as uh, Thriller. Alfred Hitchcock presents Gunsmoke, Naked City, Perry Mason, Playhouse 90. And um, oddly enough, eh, here's some trivia for, for you. Hiller directed the very first episode of The Addams Family. <laughs> so he did break into movies, and this would have been somewhere around 1970. One of his big early ones was Love Story with Ryan O'Neill. Um, his other big one was in 76, Silver Street, Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor. Um, but he, he was also, um, he also directed um, Author, Author, uh, which starred Al Pacino. He did um, a, a movie called, the title was Romantic Comedy in 83, that had Dudley Moore in it. He directed The Lonely Guy, 1984, starring Steve Martin. And he directed Teachers, a comedy drama with Nick Nolte. Um, <clears throat> then there was Outrageous Fortune with Shelley Long and Bette Midler, a very funny movie. And uh, See No Evil, Hear No Evil, which is a movie that uh, brought Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor again, back together again. And so... <clears throat> Um, and in there, um, in 79, came um, this movie, um, uh, which um, I think is maybe, well, I, th I think it's his best movie, The In-Laws. Um, uh, DJ, we know that the writer had his hand in some pretty uh, amazing material. What did he do? And what's his name? <laughs> okay. Well, before we go ahead and get into the writer, we're about that point in the show or about halfway through. So we're going to jot on over here to the snack bar where our lovely Gertie will be serving up your favorites. If you're lucky. Oops. <laughs> and uh, we'll regale you with some entertainment here, sir. So uh, go ahead and tell the folks what we're going to be listening to. <clears throat> well, I, I just found uh, an interview um, with Peter Falk and uh, Alan Arkin. They're, they're separate interviews. They were not together. But they're both talking about the movie. And uh, it's about three minutes. Um, but you'll hear from both of them as they reminisce about the in-laws. There's a movie you made with one of my favorite actors, The In-Laws, with the wonderful Peter, Peter Falk. And I know that Peter, doing those Cassavetti movies, like to improv as well. In that movie, that very funny movie, which, and you two have wonderful chemistry in it, was that a lot of improvisation? In-Laws, almost in -laws. none. Really? The script was just... Uh, brilliant. Uh, mm -hmm. Andrew Bergman wrote the script and he uh, for us, and he came in. It was ninety nine point nine percent there. The only thing we improvised that well, no, there's a couple of things we improvised. 
<laughs> this better be good. <laughs> With, there's a scene in it where Peter's supposed to be driving backwards at about 90 miles an hour through yeah. traffic. And there was some dialogue in it that was okay. But during the rehearsals where the truck is pulling, pulling us, yeah. Yeah, he starts telling me, because he wasn't really doing the scene yet. It, it wasn't much of a scene. So he starts telling me about a chicken sandwich he'd eaten that, that afternoon. <laughs> that was one of the best chicken sandwiches he'd ever eaten in the life. I said, I said, Peter, that's the dialogue for the scene. That's right. So he said, really? You think so? <laughs> and I said, yeah. So in this, in the movie now, he's driving 19 miles an hour backwards talking about the chicken sandwich he had. <laughs> uh, and, and you thought of there's another couple of other moments? Yeah, there was a couple. Well, during the, in the scene where we're uh, almost shot. Uh, yeah, that's a brilliant scene. Squad, that was, a lot of that was improvised. For those who haven't seen the movie, that's the scene where they're shooting at you and he's giving you the CIA moves of how not to be shot and it was zigzag. No, 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 sorry. No, there's a scene way later where we're on a firing squad. That's right. Yeah. 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 And uh, a lot of that was improvised, but almost, almost all of it was, was scripted. 99.9%. Mm. Mm. Uh, I'm thrilled to do stuff. If, if, if the writing's good. Yeah. If the writing works. I first met Arthur Hiller in 1965. We did a picture called Penelope. I think that when I, when I think about Arthur Hiller, um, well, let me put it this way. Of all the shoots, of all the movies, of all the television shows that I've ever done, I can't think of any one shoot that I enjoyed more than the experience on the in-laws. That was a pleasure. I don't know how Arthur does it, but he creates an atmosphere on the set which is right up my alley. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate working with him. One thing that I really love about Arthur's set is there is a total absence of tension. It is focused, effortlessly focused. And I think that's kind of a reflection of, of Arthur's personality. He, uh, he has a quiet kind of authority. And that's, uh, that's an experience that I'll always remember. Hmm. There you go. And I was watching that, um, that was on video that I uh, got the audio from. <laughs> and it was mentioned um, by, by Tommy in the chat room, I think. Peter Falk kind of famously had a glass eye. And I was watching that interview with him trying to figure out which eye was his glass eye. And I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. He does have this weird thing where one eye looks one way and the other eye kind of looks a different way. But uh, I, I just I couldn't figure out which was the real working eye at any rate. <laughs> Well, I, I've also heard that, uh, or read rather, that that's part of his acting style when he developed the character of Columbo, mm -hmm. is that he would always gesture off into the distance or something so that you wouldn't pay as much attention to, you know, his face, just kind of think that he was wondering about something and, it was, you know, his just direction for the camera. But anyway, so, all right, the rest of the creative cast here, well... The person in charge of writing the script for the in-laws was Mr. Andrew Bergman. Now, he was born in 45, February 20th, 45. So, you know, he, was, he wasn't even middle-aged at this point. But he's an American screenwriter, film director, and novelist and uh, in New York Magazine. In 1985, they dubbed him the Unknown King of Comedy. His best-known films include... Ooh, include Blazing Saddles. There you go. Mr. Gene Wilder, a favorite of ours. The in-laws, of course, tonight. And The Freshman, the original The Freshman. Now, Bergman broke into the film industry by writing the original screenplay titled Tex X that served as the basis for Mel Brooks' classic Blazing Saddles in 74. And it was among the he, he was among the co-writers who adapted it into its final state. Mr. Bergman also wrote his gangster film, Rhapsody in Crime. It was never made, though. Warner Brothers approached him to write a sequel to 
Freebie and the Bean with Peter Falk and Alan Arkin. No, no. Uh, it didn't have Peter Falk in it. It had Alan Arkin and James Caan. Oh. Swift. And mm -hmm. it did fairly well. And, and they wanted a, a sequel. But at the end of the day, what, what came out was the in-laws. <laughs> and they said, eh, okay, it's not a sequel to Freebie and the Bean. It's better. And so they made that movie um, instead. <laughs> so we've gotten to the point in the show where we're going to tell you about the things that are going to capture your attention. If you've never seen the in-laws, if you're a fan of Peter Falk and maybe you've never caught this, maybe you're like me and you're just catching on to some of these films that came out when you're just a twinkle in someone's eye. Well, um, uh, you know, I, I think there was a few times that, I was just kind of uh, dumbstruck because, of course, this is a screwball comedy. Now, Toppy, I'm going to save my moment until after you. You tell me what you think was just so off the wall that you didn't want to stop watching this. Well, I wonder if we chose the same scene. It has to be with that dictator guy. <laughs> and his little hand puppet that he made up. And Mr. Pepe. Yeah, why don't we play that clip, DJ? It is just ridiculous. Okay, is that clip three? I think so. I hope so. Bezos! No, it's not. Okay, clip four. Yeah. What's the story on this guy? The general? Yeah. Very interesting gentleman. Two things, Shell. Don't say anything about his scar. The scar? What do you mean? What scar? You'll see it, but don't see it. You follow my draft? The other thing, be sure to compliment his art collection. Beans, my good friend. My general. Oh. <laughs> a Z? What? A Z? Uh, general, I'd like you to meet Dr. Sheldon Cornpeck. Uh, Sheldon has provided invaluable assistance to the success of this mission. Yes, Dr. Cornpeck. Please, gentlemen, enter. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You nourish my friend. This is Senor Pepe. Hello. Senor Pepe, do you like this man? Oh, si, si, very much. Uh, shall we invite this man to sit down? Oh, si, 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 si. Senor Pepe, would you like to give this man a kiss? Oh, si, si, si. He's nice. Very nice. <laughs> He's nice. He's nice. He's very handsome. All right, all right, let's see them. <laughs> General, that's a hell of an act. You're a very gifted man. Muchas gracias. We oh, my God. Jesus, he's a raving protest. Don't underestimate him. The art. The art. General, your Please. art collection never fails to take my breath uh, away. Oh, yeah. the toys. Why, why did she end it there, Gigi? Okay. Okay. Uh, the toys, what do you say? Um... That that had to have been that was kind of a showstopper for me. Um, truly, one of the zanier uh, sequences, and there are a lot of zany <laughs> sequences in this movie. One one of the most famous ones that everyone always remembers is when they are uh, step off the airplane and they're greeted by a squadron of gunmen who start shooting at him and Peter Falk with his CIA <laughs> training or whatever he's had says, uh, you know, follow me, do what I do. And he says, serpentine, serpentine. And he starts <laughs> going <laughs> around in circles and Alan Arkin, who freaking doesn't know what to do, starts doing the same thing. And he keeps saying serpentine, serpentine. And uh, that's another absolutely f just fall down laughing scene and one and why one of my particular favorites is this has the dumbest car chase sequence and by dumb i mean funny uh because it just the car chase it goes nowhere they just keep going in circles uh, on and off the highway between the highways and it just the scene goes on it seems like forever and they they keep going around and around confounding the the people that are pursuing them and it's peter fault driving it's just hilarious <laughs> you know um 
I, I, I have an idea that, you know, you were probably right that uh, a lot of those same scenes are what captured me. But I, I'm going to offer a suggestion here. If, if any of you maybe have seen this or maybe you're inclined to see it a couple of times. Uh, did you get the impression, Toppy, that maybe these things were all a little too familiar to somebody like, uh, well, Peter Falk's character, Vincent, because, you know, when when uh, when um, oh Sheldon, which is Alan Arkin's character, the dentist meets him, he's not quite sure if that this guy's just a little off because, you know, they're having a dinner conversation and he's just making stuff up as he goes along. Yeah. And, um, you know, um, for somebody who is being shot at and being run after, he, he doesn't actually act all that much in fear of his life. <laughs> No, not at all. Um, <laughs> not at all. Uh, um, Aunt Tudor just posted a cartoon um, that uh, recalls that scene. Um, I'm not sure who the artist is, but <laughs> anyways. Yeah, he's remarkably without fear. And, and you know, I, I guess we, we have to assume that that he, he's just oblivious to the danger. Um, and that's why he's not fearful. And um it, it, everything's like kind of this g g game um to him um it, it is odd you know and um you you will learn early on in the film that there is a heist involved of course you know one of the first scenes of the film has this armored car that's basically being hijacked and it's carrying the plates from the mint now um you know, after after that happens, you know, you, you kind of get an idea of what's going on here. But, um, you know, again, he's he's not very afraid for somebody who's being chased after. And uh, you, you learn that he staged this. He he actually chose to, um, you know, steal the plates himself to instigate implicating this uh, developing country that he goes to visit with this this uh lunatic dictator <laughs> and um <laughs> but uh you know uh, hubby and i were were discussing it and it, it seems like he's putting on an act he is being shot at for the purposes of being noticed like he's trying to get into the public eye trying to stir up trouble so that that's what i feel is the moments you shouldn't miss is that you, you have to watch and you're like wait this screwball is being chased after he's being shot at he's just not thinking much of it but i think that one of the best scenes in the movie besides having the the black velvet painting which okay toppy did you have one of these or know someone who had one of these back in the 70s <laughs> no i i i really don't think i did but they were uh, somewhat of a thing you know, if if you're not familiar, folks, uh, back then and even now, still they they uh, they're kind of retro. They're being uh, you know um, resurfaced or what have you. But you know, the idea is you've got this painting that's on velvet, and when you bring out a light, a black light in particular, it gives it sort of a glowing quality. And there are some elements that you can't see under a normal light. And I remember seeing one for the first time when I was a kid. Now. Unlike in the in-laws where it was, uh, you know, erotic and uh, slightly um, inappropriate. Um, my cousin, when I went to visit in Florida, showed me this black pa velvet painting he had of a tiger. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just a little creepy because in this case it was over his bed and it kind of reminded me of, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Dudley Moore in that movie with Goldie Hawn. Oh, Jesus. It's not foul play. No, I think it is foul play where she had the creepy neighbor that was always hitting on her. Okay. <laughs> and he had a Murphy bed that came down with blow up dolls. But anyway, <laughs> that, that's just kind of the thing that, are, that black light paintings remind me of. So, uh, but yeah, a moment you shouldn't miss is their, their, uh, their argument in the diner. They're having lunch. And you heard that in the clip where uh, Vincent peter falk's character is talking to sheldon and he's just starting to shout and the people are watching him and at one point he yells at peter falk and he says forget about the soup because <laughs> he yeah. didn't 
smelling him. Put some crackers in your shoot, Sheldon. It's delicious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ark and, and uh, plays off of Falk and vice versa so well in this movie um you know they they really you could you could tell they were having a good time doing this movie there's a there's your tiger dj you see that (laughs) and and tudor posted a black velvet painting you know they were kind of cool if i you know i mean they very they today they're you know they're they're a thing of unto themselves um, in a certain period, you know, frankly, it had a lot to do with drugs um, and mm-hmm. psychedelic culture. But um, um, I don't know that there, there is something about them. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm not surprised they're resurfacing and kind of returning in favor. They're sort of a novelty. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, go ahead. We, I was say before we move on to our last portion here, which is our, our related recommendations, um, I was just gonna say there is somebody of 80s fame in this film because this came out in 79. Now I'm gonna ask you, Toppy, if you recognized someone. There's somebody in this cast who was part of a pretty well known sitcom. Do you uh, recognize any of the spouses? You know something. I really don't know, um, but there was something familiar. But tell me, because once you tell me, I'm going to go, oh, my God. What? Okay. So um, there was a sitcom that was about a cartoonist, and it had an actor that was on, oh, I want to say the Mary Tyler Moore show, Ted Knight, mm-hmm. and uh, called <gasps> Oh, my Ted God. Knight. And uh, the Finished. the red haired wife of the dentist was played by Nancy Desault, and she's well known for being Ted Knight's wife on Too Close for Comfort, of course, That's with it. our Jim J. Bullock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that is exactly right. And no, I knew she looked familiar. I could not place her. But that's it. This is the only other thing that I've seen her in, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, before before we get in um, to ending, uh, I, I want to talk about the ending of the movie. And, of course, it's, it's a perfect movie uh, because the whole thing is about an impending wedding. And, of course, it ends with the wedding. But I, I love the ending because it... it, it after all these two have been through, um, they 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 arrive at the wedding triumphantly, being lowered from a helicopter. They've sort of saved the day. They uh, they have a lot of cash goodies for their kids, <laughs> and uh, but I it, it just made you feel good, um, and it was I think you know a, a really satisfying ending to a very funny movie. Um, what any thoughts about uh, how it ended? It, it to me, a lot of comedies can disappoint with with mm-hmm. the ending, but I thought this this did not disappoint. Oh, absolutely! And it was just so fun because as they're wrapping things up, you're wondering, of course, are you know this group all comedy? Are the are the fathers of the bride and groom to be going to make it back in time because they've they've been. Uh, you know, they they went on an excursion. Basically, I mean, Sheldon, the dentist, the poor guy thought he was going to Scranton, mm. and he, he ends up in you know a developing country in Central America, or actually maybe South America. It's not clear, but uh, you know that yeah, they they get lowered in, and uh, well, fortunately from them, there was a miscount, and uh, you know some of the money that was uh, missing wasn't uh, on the books, so. They they got to uh, give a little wedding gift there. <laughs> yeah, it it was cute, and <laughs> I just thought it was hysterical. Ed Begley Jr., the boss of the government man, shows up, and he's he's toting along a fifty dollar gift card. Woo And you know the bride's like, "I'm just gonna stick it in here." And she puts it in the envelope with the water can. <laughs> Yeah, which which apparently is over a million dollars. <laughs> and this guy, you know, has a fifty dollar um, gift. Anyways, it was hilarious. And DJ 
what what are your recommendations? If people if people like the in laws, what do you recommend they also catch? All right. Well, I had to think about this for a moment, but it's clear to me that uh, somebody who was a fan of the in laws had to have done an homage to it uh, a fair number of years later. There was a film in 2000 who starred another famous actor, Robert De Niro, and he played a government man. But in this case, they reversed the roles. Instead of being the father of the groom, he was the father of the bride-to-be in a film called Meet the Parents. And this was a film made in 2000 with Ben Stiller. And it also had... I want to say, um, oh, I'm trying to forget. I'm trying to remember her name now, but uh, Tommy in the chat room or Aunt Tudor might remember. Gwyneth Paltrow's mother is a, is a famous actress. I'm trying to remember her name. I thought that she was in Meet the Parents. But yes, Meet the Parents seems like a, a modern redo. I never, that's, that's good. DJ. I never thought of that, but it is kind of. Um, very similar in that way. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, they just kind of changed up a little bit. But um, also, if you enjoyed The In-Laws, I think another film you should check out that actually came out the same year in 79 as The In-Laws is a film with another couple of fine actors that I like and enjoy. Mr. Dustin Hoffman and Meryl Streep did a movie in 79 called Kramer vs. Kramer. Okay, <laughs> certainly a good movie. Not at all a comedy, mm. but uh, yeah, um, very good. Um, my choices are, um, uh, for one thing, if if you like that Alan Arkin, and who doesn't? But um, you would also enjoy uh, his role in Little Miss Sunshine from two thousand and six, a comedy with Greg Kinnear. Steve Carell and Tony Collette. I loved that movie so hard when it came out. It was so funny and so sweet. I loved it. And Alan <clears throat> Arkin plays the subversive grandfather, uh, who's really funny. And so, uh, if you like, if you want to see more of Alan Arkin, check that out. Another great movie Alan and Arkin is in, more towards the beginning of his career, is um, Wait Until Dark a thriller with um oh lordy oh, J oh i'm brain farting famous actress who uh, always looked divine she was in breakfast at tiffany's audrey hepburn thank you audrey hepburn wait until dark alan arkin is a villain in that movie and he's totally creepy um also just in in um honor of the screwball comedy which is just a term that sort of described a lot of comedies from the 30s in particular um that they were they're just nutty 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 comedies and they were they came to be called screwball comedies and my opinion is the in-laws is a modern day screwball comedy but if you want to see the mother of uh, all screwball comedies Go and see 1938's Bringing Up Baby. My God. Screwy, nutty, and hilarious. Catherine Hepburn and Cary Grant are in that. 1938 Bringing Up Baby. And finally, if you, you know, if you can't get enough of Peter Falk, you know, and, and you've never seen it, shame on you, but do check out his Columbo. It's an iconic character. There's lots of episodes, and he's so good in it. And uh, in general, it was high quality for TV, I think, with excellent scripts um, and and uh, and um, uh, great TV. And Peter Falk is in, you know, just about every scene. So those are my recommendations. Okay, so, uh, you know, and I just want to point out, folks, that uh, for somebody who likes Tony Collette and Little Miss Sunshine, uh, I have a personal goal for Toppy. He hasn't seen Muriel's Wedding! No, <laughs> we <haven't. laughs> so uh, we will set forth to make good on that. So, all right, folks, 
Nights. We are uh, just stepping out to the lobby here, and uh, we're going to give you a tease of what's to come. Toppy, dig out that bag of coins that the magician left us. All right, let me see here. Here we go. All right, put that in the slot there. All right. Alrighty, so next time when we get together, it's going to be Friday, May 1st, of course, at the same time, 9 p.m. Eastern. Toppy, open that capsule for me. Tell us what's coming up. All right, next time, kids. Uh, it's from the director who brought us the last picture show with Silva Shepard, and he also directed Mask with Cher. Who are we talking about? Uh, well, you'll find out when we take a look at the 70s, early 70s comedy starring Barbara Streisand and Ryan O'Neill, another screwball comedy, What's Up, Doc? And it's going to be our Mother's Day tribute. All right, and I have it on good authority that this is the film debut of one Madeline Kahn. <laughs> oh, my God, she's wonderful in this movie. Flames doing the sound of the side of my face, Flames. <laughs> Yes. Oh, my God. Oh, folks, what's up, Doc? When I saw this movie, I swear I laughed from beginning to end. Uh, it was a long time ago, but I and we'll see. You know, I have not seen this movie in a damn long time. And I wonder if I'll still find it that funny. Well, we'll see. Thank you to everyone who showed up in the chat room. Toppy, remind us once again who is here tonight. Well, we thank very much for the presence of our pal Tommy, who always stops by and visits us on the occasion of Matt Name Anusha, and as well does our Aunt Tudor. We thank them both very much. And uh, we also had your husband, Billy, who's probably... If you're upstairs, I imagine he's downstairs on the couch with probably a cat or two on top of him. <laughs> yes. And uh, Tommy in the chat room tells us that uh, Gwyneth Paltrow's mother is Blythe Danner. So Blythe Danner is in Meet the Parents, as, as well as um, Tu Wong Fu. Thanks for everyone, Julie Numar. But anyways, all right. Well, say good night, Gracie. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Come back again this time. Good night, Gracie. Thank you for listening to Matinee Minutia. Our show streams live on the first and third Friday of the month. Go to univazpods.net, click the tower for audio, enter Discord for chat. You can find our show anywhere you listen to podcasts. Visit our webpage at matineeminutia.com. Tweet us on Twitter at Matinee Minutia. Find our group on Facebook. Have an idea for a show? Or let us know how we're doing. Email us at matinemanusha at gmail.com. I have a voice. I have a voice. You have a voice. You have a voice. We have a voice. We have a voice. Unique voices in podcasting. Univazpods.net. Hey, I am uh, going to go ahead and exit the live show here, ending broadcast.